Hey everyone, and welcome to Faith. My name is Matt, and we are so glad that you've decided to join us today. You might be watching from your house or from a friend's house. You might be with other people or by yourself, but however you're watching today, we are just so grateful that you are here. We believe that even if you don't believe what we believe, or if you feel like your life is just way too messy to step foot in a church, you belong here. We're a community of broken people who are all on a journey toward Jesus. So we believe that you belong in this family. Today, we're gonna to continue in our series, The Being Challenge, and we'll hear from Pastor Doug in a moment. But before we dive in, would you do us a favor? We would love if you would just share this video on social media. We believe this is one of the best ways that we can spread the good news of Jesus across New England. So we would love it if you would share this message on Facebook. If you're new with us today, we wanna to especially welcome you to our church. And we're so glad that you're here. And to celebrate, we want to pledge a $5 donation to a charity of your choice out of our pockets. All you got to do is just text Faith Church to 97,000 and then follow the steps as a guest. Once you do that, we'll send you an email asking which charity you wish us to donate to. And that's it. So again, take out your phone. You can do it right now and text Faith Church to 97,000 and we can pledge that $5 donation today. If you'd like to partner with us today and give, the best way to do that is to text that same word, Faith Church, to 97,000. You'll get a text reply back that will direct you from there. Our whole mission here at Faith is to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus. And it's because of your generosity that we're able to do that. So thank you for giving. And with all that being said, our weekend experience is here, and it all starts right now. Hey everyone, and again, we just want to welcome you to Faith. My name is Sam, and here's everything happening inside Faith Church right now. We have some exciting news about our big outreach this summer. We all know that a change of scenery is good for the soul, especially when it allows us to connect deeper with God. This summer, we are going to embark on a very special mission trip. This mission trip is local and only four days. Douglas Camp Meeting in Douglas, Mass. is a Christian campground serving local ministries. They partner every year with Walking Light Ministries to provide a Christian camp experience for inner city teenagers without charging them a cent. That's amazing. And it tells the story of a, of a camp ministry committed to share the hope found in Jesus. This camp has been around for years. And with new leadership, we hope to play a role in the restoration of this historic site into a relevant and exciting place to be. The cool part is, is that it's just 20 minutes away from our Faith Church campus. We are hoping to fund an outdoor basketball court and help with windows as well, and laying a helping hand in these projects and much more. The mission's strip date is August 18th to the 21st, and we have two orientations for May where you can find more information about this. Consider signing up at faithauburn.info. Today, we want to do something that is above and beyond like every single month. It's called the Dollar Mission Fund. Each month, we ask 100% of you to give $1 to this fund, and we give 100% of it away to the partner of the month. Some of you can give more, but all of us can give at least $1. And every single dollar given to the fund today will go towards the summer mission strip. To give to this fund, text $1 to 84321 or scan the QR code in front of you. Thank you for helping us go above and beyond for the ministries that we support. If you're new with us, if you've been coming for a few months, you might have some questions. What do you believe? What is there for my family? How can I become members? Our next step classes are designed for anyone who is new to Faith Church or want to get more involved. In these classes, you'll discover where you belong, what we believe, and who God is inviting you to become. Classes will be held on Zoom starting May 16 at 7.30. To sign up, text Faith Church to 97,000 and click on the Next Step option. We are so excited for you to embark on this journey. For all signups and next steps, text Faith Church to 97,000 or visit faithauburn.info. We'd love for you to connect with us this season.
Welcome back to week three of our Being Challenge, where we are challenging one another to be like Jesus by doing the things that Jesus did. We're focusing on five keystone habits, the habits of Jesus that are small but reap a big reward. This next keystone habit of Jesus has the capacity to transform our lives. It's prioritizing prayer. Now, many of us have some inkling of what prayer is all about. In fact, more than half of all Americans say that they pray every day. Maybe you pray before meals or you pray before bedtime. Maybe you pray while you're sitting in traffic or you pray before a big test. Maybe you learn to pray while you were a little boy or a little girl kneeling at your bedside. But now you're a little bit older. Perhaps you're wondering, so what's it all about? What is the essence of prayer? I mean, what does it mean to really talk to God? No doubt we'd all agree that any great relationship needs, requires great communication. Without one-to-one -one dialogue, you simply can't be close or experience intimacy with another person. If you're going to genuinely connect with another human being, be it a spouse, a friend, or a relative, you need to know how to converse and talk. Last summer, Joanne and I headed out to the end of the Cape and spent some real quality time together, some much needed R&R and, R and us time. While we were walking on the beach together, we happened upon an area known as Marconi's Beach. It's the place where 120 years ago, Guillermo Marconi sent the first wireless transatlantic message across the Great Divide from U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt to King Edward VII of Great Britain. I mean, here were the remnants of the Marconi station right here in the sand. And it took years of perfecting the wireless technology and massive amounts of money to accomplish the task. But what once took such great effort and cost to send and receive a tiny minuscule message from the U.S. to Europe now happens, well, multitudes of times every second, covering much greater distances with enormous amounts of information for pennies in the dollar. We live in a day of instant communication. On my phone, I can get news protests, news of protests, marches happening in the Philippines, happening right now, in fact. I, I could Skype with someone from China right now. I can receive emails from Nairobi right now, all simultaneously. But I'd contend that with all of our technological devices that we have, that we're not so much communicating with one another, we're not really having real conversations. The same is true in prayer. We're tempted to think that as long as we're speaking our prayers that we're really praying. But, but if you be honest today with yourself, you probably have to admit that our prayers sometimes maybe seem shallow at best. We are saying our prayers, but not really praying. Many of us would probably say that we need a little help in this area. I met lots of people who are just not sure of how to pray, pray in the right way. They don't know if they're doing it right. Is there a special formula? Are there particular words to use? One day, the disciples came to Jesus and found him praying. And on this specific occasion, they mustered up the courage to ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. After watching and listening to Jesus pray to the Father myriads of times before, it seems they were finally concluding that they'd been doing it all wrong. There was something different in the way that Jesus prayed that was unique, far different from their own prayer times. Even though they had been brought up praying, taught how to pray by their moms and dads and religious leaders, there was something, something in the way that Jesus prayed and how he spoke to the Father, which was different, captivating, winsome. They finally asked the question. They finally asked Jesus, uh, the, probably the question that Jesus had been waiting for them to ask, teach us to pray. I wonder if that could be our desire today. Today, I believe with all my heart, Jesus needs to school us in our prayer lives. We shouldn't be offended by that, but we should be happy because we're getting schooled by the only one in history who got it right. Here is Jesus, who had a perfect relationship with the Father, and consequently, his communication with the Father was, was the same way. 
perfect. If we were to be completely honest with one another, we'd have to admit that much of our praying just kind of simply isn't working. At the very least, a lot of prayers are, shall we say, getting unanswered. Some of our prayers are getting answered, yes, like maybe the prayer last week to find your missing car keys, right? But as it turns out, go figure, they were right there in the very place you left them. Maybe you prayed last week for a parking spot close to the door at the mall, but as it turns out, a hundred other non-prayers got as good a spot as you did without praying. Or how about your favorite sports team? that you prayed for and, and they won. But as it turned out, well, the odds were that they were expected to win anyway. But there were other kinds of prayers you prayed where God didn't come through. Your family member didn't get better. Your marriage didn't survive. Your son or daughter, well, they didn't come back home. You didn't find Mr. Right. Occasionally, yeah, you get a yes, but more often than not, you get a nothing. And it's those series of nothings that leave you wondering, does prayer really work? Or is it just a waste of time? You prayed and nothing happened. And you're right. Sometimes our prayers go unanswered. And yet Jesus still prayed and still urged and challenged his followers to pray because there was something valuable about the conversation. What the disciples learned about the way Jesus prayed Man, it wasn't scripted or rehearsed, but it was just natural conversation, like a conversation between friends. There was something going on between Jesus and his heavenly father that they weren't accustomed to. There was more passion, more energy, more intensity, more earnestness, and that left them feeling maybe a little bit discontent about their own prayer life. Lord, teach us to pray to which Jesus was probably thinking, I thought you'd never ask. Truthfully, I'm actually encouraged by the disciples' request. A group of men that had likely prayed many times before, because I've prayed many times before, but I also must admit that prayer is an area in my own life that I wanna grow, I wanna get better at, I wanna be stronger in it, I, I want it. But sometimes it's hard, and I don't know what to do, what to say, or how to grow. You know, even Martin Luther, the great church reformer back in the 1500s, he once said this about prayer. Sometimes I feel I am becoming cold and apathetic about prayer. This is usually because of all the things that are distracting me and filling my mind. We have to be absolutely certain that we do not allow ourselves to be distracted from genuine prayer. The devil is not lazy. He will never stop attacking us. See, through the years, as I've studied the life of Jesus in the four Gospels of our New Testament, I've found nearly 50 times that Jesus either practiced prayer or taught on the importance of prayer. Jesus is shown praying alone, praying in public, praying in the morning, first thing, praying in the evening, praying before meals, before important decisions, before and after healings. Let's focus primarily today on the Gospel of Luke and the prayer life of Jesus. Jesus is shown in Luke as the praying Messiah. He not only teaches about prayer in several unique parables, like the one in Luke chapter 11 or Luke chapter 18, but Jesus is seen praying in the Gospel of Luke more than all three other Gospels combined. So what do we learn about the prayer life of Jesus? There are four snapshots in Luke that I want to examine kind of look into that teach us a lot about the right way to pray. First, Jesus prayed early and often. It says in Luke 5, 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Literally it says, but he himself was withdrawing in the desert places and praying. There was this continuous moving away from the crowds and towards conversation with the Father. The more the crowds congregated, the more they gathered as a result of the healings of Jesus, the more Jesus turned away from them to the desert regions and prayed with the Father. The wild enthusiasm of the crowds was running ahead of their comprehension of Christ and his mission and message. And Jesus 
They just could not risk letting their ambition somehow drive the train. So in order to stay on point, to stay on mission, Jesus retreated to pray. We see Jesus praying alone early, often, consistently, out in nature, in solitude, overnight, you name it. Jesus was praying. You get the sense that everywhere he went, he prayed and was in constant communication with the Father. Prayer was a priority in the life of Jesus at all times and in all circumstances. In his best-selling book, Essentialism, Greg McCohen explains the surprising history of the word priority and how its meaning has kind of shifted over time. He says this, the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. It was singular. It meant the very first or prior thing. It stayed singular until the 1900s when we pluralized the term and started talking about priorities. Illogically, we reasoned that by changing the word, we could bend reality. Somehow, we would now be able to have multiple first things. People and companies routinely try to do just that. They talk about pry one, pry two, pry three, and so on. This gives the impression of many things being the priority, but actually means, means nothing. It means nothing. See, prayer has to be the priority. Your, your first resort, resort not, not the last resort, but the first response. What habits are there in your life when it comes to talking with the Father? That ultimately is what prayer is. It's communicating with God. Prayer is a tool that God gives to us to just simply connect with him. Remember, the success of any relationship has to start with communication, with true conversation. So think about this. If our goal is to follow Jesus and be in a relationship with the very God that created us, then it's so important that I make prayer, talking with God, a priority in my life. I need to grow in my communication with him, my prayer life. But we also must ask, why? Why would Jesus pray and communicate with God, his Father, so much and so often? Well, we find out here that Jesus prayed because he needed direction. You ever been lost? I mean, like really lost? While my wife was in Florida last year visiting her parents, she called up a friend who lived up in Orlando, and they made arrangements uh, to have dinner at the Cracker Barrel in Orlando. There was one simple problem. Somehow, the directions to Cracker Barrel in Tampa were punched in. And so as they were driving along, more than one time, my father-in-law said, are you sure we're going the right way? Right restaurant, wrong city. See, I want to argue that while we can laugh at this story, that many of us spiritually are doing the very same thing when it comes to our walk with God. We want to end our journey at the pearly gates. And yet, we seem to be blindly following the directions towards a different destination. Now, can I just ask a difficult but important question right now? Whose directions do you follow? Do you follow the GPS of the world or the GPS of God? What are you chasing that the world offers and that you so desperately want? There may be some things that look appealing on the outside, on the surface maybe, but following the world's directions you just make, will just make you a normal person and ultimately land you in the wrong place. Let me tell you what's normal today for people living today. Evit says that the average American hasn't made a friend, one friend, new friend in the last five years. Cigna says 61% of Americans are lonely and that was pre-pandemic. 73% of all Americans are in some serious form of debt, according to Northwestern Mutual. Career Builder tells us that 78% of all people live paycheck to paycheck. Gallup says that in the USA, 70% 70 70 of all people working are unhappy and don't care about what they do. And about half of all marriages end in divorce in our country. And we're the worst, sixth worst in the world. So that's what it means to be normal. <laughs> All these statistics are reasons that I'm not interested in being normal. I want to be different. I want to challenge the status quo and tell you there's a better way. Rather than following the ways of the world, we can actually follow God and his direction. 
Luke 6 tells us about an incident that happened early in the ministry of Jesus. And one of those days, Jesus went up on a mountain, a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called to his disciples to him, whom he also designated as apostles. These were the 12. When Jesus needed direction, what did he do? He went to the Father for the next play in the playbook. He consulted with his Father rather than having a prideful, independent spirit that says, I can do it myself. He chose instead to lean on his Father. You know, back in the Old Testament, Solomon, the wise king, said it so wonderfully, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. God's redemptive plan relied on the men Jesus chose as his disciples. Not only would they play a significant part in his ministry, but they would play a key role in the establishment of the church. He prayed all day, all night, to get from his father the names of the men who would change the world. The only perfect person to ever exist knew that big decisions and prayer needed to go hand in hand. When you're making important decisions, what a powerful tool you have whereby you can access God and his infinite wisdom. So the next time you have an important decision to make, like choosing a job, choosing a mate, choosing a place to live, why not spend considerable time in prayer, just like Jesus? Jesus also needed something even more vital. Jesus prayed because he needed strength. Even Jesus got overwhelmed. I know he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And one of the places where we see most evidently his humanness, his human nature come out is just before the crucifixion. The gospel writers tell us that Jesus took his disciples out to a place called Gethsemane, which literally means the place of crushing, because it was there that, that there's an olive grove, and that's where you press the olives to make olive oil. Jesus intentionally chooses this place to pray, this place of crushing, in order to pour out his heart and lament before God regarding the agony he was about to endure. He tells them that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow. And the Greek word there is agonia, our word for agony, a sorrow to the point of death. And then Luke adds something that the other gospel writers do not. He says this, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus was overwhelmed with a kind of sorrow to the point of death, which caused a very real physical condition known as hematidrosis, the moment when capillaries dilate to the point of bursting, releasing blood through the sweat glands. It's caused by a severe and extreme stress upon the body. I'll bet some of you didn't know that Jesus could in fact become that overwhelmed, but he did. So where did he go? He went to the Father for strength. He went to his Father to express his pain. Jesus conquered at Calvary because he was committed to pray in Gethsemane. The reason we come to God in prayer is we need help. We need him to intervene. We realize we can't tackle this problem on our own. We are powerless in facing some of life's toughest situations that come upon us. We can't fix some things that are broken with our own power or strength, but God can. In a simple prayer that says, God, I need you. I've tried in my own strength and I can't do it. Praying to God is admitting that you're powerless, powerless over whatever is confronting you. And as you're admitting, God, I need you, you're declaring two things. You're declaring you're not God and that God is God. It's not only thinking of yourself in the proper light, but it's putting God on his throne. It's declaring that he's greater, he's capable. Now, as Jesus needed strength to endure, how much more, how much more do we need strength to conquer our own worries and our own fears, our guilt, our grief, whatever other demons may be attacking us? In just a couple of weeks, we're gonna start a sermon series based upon the thoughts of Christian psychologist, Dr. Henry Cloud. I'm really excited about it. 
Last year, just prior to the pandemic and the subsequent shutdown of everything, Dr. Cloud had a double knee surgery replacement, double knee replacement, both knees, <laughs> couldn't walk for the entire year. And this one time very active man noticed something happening emotionally within him, depression, severe depression, like never before. Close friends came over to pray with him and pray over him. And while in prayer, he felt this deep, uh, great heaviness d deep within. And what happened next was really a God thing. Prompted by the Holy Spirit, his wife Tori said out loud to everybody, I, I get the sense that you are dealing with some kind of loss from your childhood. Now, Henry had never told her this before. He had, he had been paralyzed as a child for nearly two years as a, as, a, as a young child, never really processed it with anyone. And while in prayer that night, he began to weep and lament and just pour out his pain in prayer. It was the first time that he had let God have those emotions of pain from childhood. See, your grieving plan needs to include prayer time with God. You need more than just a five-minute fix of prayer, but you need a prayer life. You need to change the narrative of life of how you're seeing it. It's like watching a Netflix movie and getting to push the pause button to take a break. When we're in pain, you get to push the pause button of pain and reassess. See, without prayer, we get lost in the subjective moment of our pain. But prayer gets us above our present narrative of pain. We get perspective. We get a true view of our lives and what God is intending. Maybe even why we're suffering in the first place. At the very least, we get strength. Lastly, Jesus prayed because prayer changes things. On the night before the crucifixion, there huddled together in the upper room, Jesus said to Peter the Rock, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you. Now notice, Jesus does not say Peter, Peter. If you remember, Jesus had renamed Simon Peter, which means rock. The Aramaic name, his original name, Simon, uh, sounds a lot like the word for a reed. You know, those reeds out in the field which blow to and fro in the wind. But early on, Jesus renames him Peter, the rock. But now in this fateful dark night, Jesus is going back to calling him Simon, because tonight, Peter is going to once again sway like a reed. He's going to deny his Lord. One translation says of Jesus, Satan has demanded, while another even says, Satan has claimed the right to sift you. Now that sh thought may shock some of us because that, that Satan has that kind of authority over us, but it's true. Satan asked to sift. But I have prayed for you, Peter, for you, Simon, rather, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You'll strengthen your brothers. See, he was about to lose the battle, but not the war. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not ultimately fail, like Judas. And when you've turned back, when you've repented, when you've come to your senses, you'll be a source of strength to your brothers. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what Peter became. Because Jesus knew prayer changes things. James, the brother of Jesus, puts it this way. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its effect. Now, you may say, well, I'm not a righteous person. But if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Father in heaven sees you as righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that you always do the righteous thing. But it does mean that when the Father looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ covering you. So what does it mean for us today? It means that your prayers matter. It means that they, they actually can make a difference. It means that when we're in a conversation and prayer with God, that we have the ability with him to change what's happening in the world. Now, I don't know how prayer works. But I don't know how my iPhone works either, and yet I use it all the time. See, prayer ultimately is an act of faith, a faith that says, I believe in you, God, and I believe that you can make the difference. And when we believe that God does listen to our prayers and that they actually matter, it means that we can pray with the same desperation that people like Hezekiah prayed 
There, he, we prayed for God granted, grant, to grant him 15 more years. It means that we can pray with the same expectation that Elijah prayed for when he prayed that God would send fire down from heaven in order that others might know that he's the one true God. It means that we can pray with the same trust that Daniel prayed with, the trust that saw Daniel live through being thrown into a den of lions. It means that we can pray with the same faith that Jesus prayed when he healed the sick, when he calmed the storm, even raised the dead. It means that we can pray with the same passion that the disciples prayed for when they healed the sick and raised the dead and began the church. And we pray with the same excitement and hope that some of our church fathers, those who've gone before us, prayed for when they prayed that God would show them his grace. Because our God answers our prayers, not always the way we want him to, not always in the timing that we desire, but in the ways which his will is done in this world and always for our benefit, never for our detriment. You see, if we come at this with the notion that God is a favor distributor, that he is ob obligated to answer me the way I want him to, then guess what? You will be sorely disappointed. And some of you quit praying probably because God didn't do what you asked him to do. And you assumed that unanswered prayer said something about God, but in reality, it said something about your view of God. You probably concluded this, God doesn't answer prayer. And therefore, God doesn't care. Hence, God isn't there. In other words, you're seeing him as a kind of a genie in the bottle, a vending machine divine who distributes blessings according to your wishes. Just rub the lamp. But Jesus doesn't teach us that. He doesn't show us that. What if prayer is the means by which you rightly relate and converse with your heavenly Father who art in heaven? To have conversation with him as you would with anyone else, telling him your hopes, your dreams, your desires, your hurts, your pain, your sorrows. What if prayer is the place where you communicate your love and your surrender to his will, no matter what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if you started every day that way? Here's how I want to challenge you today. Start your day the right way. Pray. One week without prayer makes one week. Let's make prayer a priority. The real problem of our lives is not the problem of unanswered prayer, but the problem of unoffered prayer. The real tragedy is not not getting what you want. The real tragedy is not praying for what you need. Literally, let prayer be the very first thing you do this week. Every morning, let, let's start our day the right way. I like what Benjamin Franklin said, the early morning has gold in its mouth. How you start your day matters. The very first thing before your feet hit the floor, pray. I'm talking before you open your emails, check your social media, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, get your coffee, watch the news, pray. Make it a priority. Put it, it's a pro put it in its proper place. Start by thanking God for a new day and then pray for help. It's a new day, God. I'm coming to you first. I need your help. You're the one that brings help into this world. I need your direction. Guide me, Holy Spirit. And thank you, God, for being real and changing not just me, but the world. Now, as we close today, let's spend a few minutes in prayer right now, right here, right now. We're going to put on your screen a list of things that you can pray for. Let's spend some time right now giving these things over to God. And then we'll close with a worship song in just a few moments. If you're by yourself, maybe you just want to say these things out loud. Maybe, maybe you're with a group of people there in your living room and you're watching this. And as the things come up on the screen, maybe just go around the circle and, and say them out loud as you go around the circle, each one. If you're there, maybe watching this with your spouse, maybe take turns just going back and forth, saying these things that you see on the screen.
grace of God, we sing these songs. There is no fear, cause I believe. There is no doubt, cause I have seen your faithfulness, my fortress.
Thank you again for joining us today. We hope that you'll continue to take the challenge with us over the last few weeks here. And for more information about the Being Challenge, text Faith Church to 97000 and follow the steps. Or you can visit faithauburn.org and click on the Being Challenge link at the top. In just a moment, we're going to have some discussion questions come up on the screen so that you can further process the, con the content of today's message with some other people. But ultimately, we believe that there's a next step for you to take today to further connect with God and with other people. First of all, if you're new with us, we invite you to fill out that Connect card and let us know that you're new. You can do that by texting Faith Church to 97000 and following the steps as a guest. Another simple next step is to just share the service to your own Facebook page. We believe that God has surrounded you with people who need the good news of Jesus. And sharing the service is a great way to start that conversation with them. Another way to further connect is by attending one of our in-person services, which happen on Sundays at 9 or 11 a.m. Just be sure to pre-register and let us know that you're coming. For all signups and next steps, text Faith Church to 97000 or visit faithauburn.info. And we'd love to help you get connected this season. Thanks again for watching. We hope you have a great week. Thank you.